everybody quiet down. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming. Wow, we have a packed, a packed hall. Uh, nobody tell the fire marshal. Uh, my name is Brian Bender, as you heard. I'm Politico's defense editor, and my colleague Jacqueline is one of our defense and national security reporters. We're glad to have all of you here on, I think, a, an interesting day in, in an interesting time. It's the 55th anniversary, as we all know, uh, of John F. Kennedy's famous moon speech. And I think it's going to be a timely discussion, but I also think that um, before we start, I'd like to share just a few words from the speech itself, um, which really struck me. The president began on this day 55 years ago at Rice University with these words. We meet in honor, we meet in an hour of change and challenge, in a decade of hope and fear, in an age of both knowledge and ignorance. The greater our knowledge increases, the greater our ignorance unfolds. Of course, he went on to say that we will go to the moon by the end of the decade, and he spurred an age of innovation uh, that really laid out a vision, I think, that we're still feeling today. And I'm sure many of you in this room were probably inspired by that speech or some of the events that speech led to. Um, and one of the things he said at the end of the speech was that it was time to take the space program from low gear into high gear and that that would be one of the most important things he would do as president. And so I wanted to um, sort of lay that out there as we start to think about how far we've come since then, what the space program has meant to America, what it's meant to private industry, what it's meant for our daily lives, because as we know, the space program has driven lots and lots of change. And our conversation tonight will take place uh, in two parts. Uh, the first will explore the legacy of JFK's speech, as I mentioned. And the second panel will talk about where we go from here, because as we all know, we're sort of at an inflection point uh, when it comes to space policy. Um, we now have a lot of other players, not just government players, in this arena. And there's lots of open questions about what the government is going to do, what the government's role is in encouraging that private investment, that private exploration. And so, without further ado, um, I do want to thank our sponsors, Digital Globe, of course, for, for sponsoring this event tonight. We couldn't have done it without them. And Jacqueline here is going to continue and introduce our panel. Yeah, and just a, a quick reminder to please join our conversation on Twitter. You can post questions and use the hashtag PoliticoSpace. Um, and now I'd, I'd like to introduce our panel. We have John Logsdon, who founded George Washington University's Space Policy Institute. He's also the author of John F. Kennedy and the Race to the Moon, which looks at how Kennedy's actions shaped our space program today. He also witnessed the historic Apollo 11 launch in 1969 that first put humans on the moon. Uh, then we have Teasel Muir Harmony. She's the curator of the Space History Department at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum. While writing her dissertation on the Apollo project, she was actually struck by lightning just a few days before the project was due, but still managed to finish it on time. <laughs> and then we have Alex McDonald, who is the senior economic advisor at NASA and an, asper and an expert on the economic history of American space exploration. He told me ahead of the program that he has been referred to as the godfather of the Lithuanian space program. So be sure to ask him about that after the fact. <laughs> Um, so thanks to all of our panelists and our audience for being here, and let's just get started. John, I wanted to, to start with you. You witnessed one of the, the biggest defining moments that was inspired by Kennedy's speech. So I'm, I'm hoping you can talk about why this speech was so impactful and what about it inspired this new generation of Americans and American scientists to, to reach for space. Well, first of all, one has to recognize that Kennedy was not a space visionary. He might have been a visionary, I think he was a visionary for the future of the country, but his decision to go to the moon was a very pragmatic, geopolitical, competitive decision that the United States could not be second in space, that the whole arena of space just starting was so full of promise for the country and that the Soviet Union had had the first satellite, the first uh, mission to land on the moon, then the first 
human in space, Yuri Gagarin, and Kennedy said, this is not acceptable. We, we've got to do this. So uh, he, he, he combined the dreams of centuries, the image of the future with the politics of the moment and said, let's go to the moon. Uh, let me ask you, Teasel. You did your, your PhD thesis on the Apollo program. What, tell us a little bit about what captured you. How did you get into this business, and did that decade of the 60s that Kennedy launched have a lot to do with it? Well, um, when I was doing research for a different project, I, I came across some material on um, the public opinion of uh, American space exploration, especially in other countries, and um, some space exhibits abroad in particular. And the amount of enthusiasm there was to walk by a space capsule um, was really shocking to me, and I wanted to find out more about that. So. Um, in the early 60s, people would wait in line for three to up to eight hours to walk by a, a space capsule that was on tour around the world. And so um, I was really, really curious what was drawing people to um, the space program, what was that enthusiasm, and then also how was that tied to um, American foreign relations interests at the time. So there's an extraordinary investment in not only Project Apollo and the American space program, but then also sharing um, the message about successes abroad, um, and then utilizing that to support U.S. foreign relations positions in various places. Alex, you, you work at NASA. Tell us a little bit, how much does that speech, uh, the events that it set off, still animate the place where you work? Yeah, I, mean, I think hugely. I mean, I, I rewatched it today um, you know, as a reminder, and uh, what I was struck by, actually, was how much of the speech is actually not about going to the moon. It's, it's about how much of it is really about why it is within the history and the capabilities of the American people to explore space exploration. He spends the first half of the talk going about that. He only mentions the uh, why the moon part at about the eight-minute mark of an 18-minute talk. And what I think was really interesting was, you know, he, he also mentions kind of, you know, where he is in Rice. And he says, it's, it's great to be here at Rice, at a college known for knowledge, in a city known for progress, in a state known for strength, at a time which we need all three. And I think those kind of pieces still motivate really the National Space Program in a real way. Knowledge, progress, and also strength in the national security domain as well. And so I think uh, it really provides a, a guidepost and really kind of an exemplar of the space speech. But, but obviously a lot has changed uh, since that speech 55 years ago. And you know, I'm curious, John, you mentioned this, uh, you touched on this. The driving forces behind that speech and behind the space program were very different from what drives space programs today. And I think it'd be interesting to hear from, from, from all of you your view of sort of how it's different and, and what are the driving forces now? Um, how are they different from they were then? And, and, and what does that mean for kind of where we go from here? Well, I'm going to do something that's very improper on a panel like this, which is correct you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the speech that you're referring to was at Rice University, September the 12th, 1962. That's not when Kennedy announced his decision to go to the moon. He did it before a joint session of Congress, May the 25th, 1961. Uh, so the, the, the Rice speech was the full-up rhetoric of why we're doing this, but the decision had already been made. And it had been made in response to a Kennedy memo a month earlier that asked an interesting question. Find me a space program which promises dramatic results in which we could win. And the answer came back, moon, for a bunch of technical reasons. Now, what's the question today that says moon, Mars, leaving the near vicinity of this planet? That's, that's the problem that vexes all of us in this space community, is there's no clear-cut rationale for doing this other than for those of us that have been involved in it for a career and a lifetime, uh, we'd like to do it. It's time to go. Well, Diesel, I mean, is there a rationale now to do it, whatever it is, whether it's to go to the moon, whether it's to fuel a new private space economy uh, that is quite different from this sort of government-controlled approach that has um, characterized the last decades? But you know, what is, what's the reason to do all this? Is it just to make money now? Or is it more than that? Um, I think there are lots of different rationales, and I think this some complicates things quite a bit. But in the past, at least, the rationales usually are related to national security or the economy or um, uh, 
politics in some way. Um, uh, but um, things like public interest tend to be less, less of a, a factor. Um, but the, when you think back to the Apollo program and the geopolitical context, then as John was saying, it's, it's just so extremely different. And so to try to interpret what um, the decisions that were made um, in the early 1960s to send uh, people to the moon and bring them back to Earth, it's hard to apply that same kind of rationale or even look for a, a very similar type of motivation um, to, to shape space policy today. But it's still there, mm -hmm. you know, the sense that space is an element of U.S. leadership, that it demonstrates our, Alex in his book will talk about the signaling right. effect of space achievement. Uh, I think it's still there, uh, underpinning all the other potential reasons. So I c can I just add something to that? Mm -hmm. um, during the, the early space race, the, the, an essential part of um, the competition was not just beating the Soviet Union, but this global audience that was so interested in space achievements. And both the Soviet Union and the United States recognized that um, uh, space accomplishments had huge potential for political alignment um, and global, global leadership. And there's, there's, I think, a big question today whether or not um, U.S. space accomplishments are still having the same impact abroad that they did, or even if that would be something to motivate us. So space leadership, I think, has to be interpreted differently today than it would have been then. But, but is, is space leadership reason enough, Alex? I mean, in other words, you get an impression that in recent years, since the end of the space shuttle program, that NASA, at least as a perception, is kind of trying to figure out what is its compass, what is its mission. Um, how does the, the agency see it? I mean, wh what is this all about? What is it for? Or is the agency kind of trying to figure that out? All right, so that's a pretty deep question. And I'm going to have to take it back about 100 years ago to the first institution that funded space exploration technology in this country, uh, which was not NASA. It was the Smithsonian. And why did the Smithsonian provide any funds for this? Well, basically, a guy named Robert Goddard uh, decided that he wanted to pursue this technology for the kind of intrinsic motivations that John was referring to. And he submitted a proposal, and he found some receptive ears, and they sent back a check. And he d was delighted that this is a way you can make money. And he then you know, proceeded to spend the rest of his life working on space technology, mostly funded by the private sector, mostly funded by these intrinsic motivations that people have uh, to go into space. He was also funded by the US military. But half came from the military, half came from about the Guggenheim family. OK, so that takes you kind of through the, the 40s and 50s. Um, obviously, a lot of investment in military technology, launch vehicles for military technology purposes at that period of time. Um, and then in the 60s, the kind of dynamics that John was referring to lead to a demand for a signal, a leadership signal, right, a way to win. And that leads to a historically unprecedented amount of funding for space exploration for the Apollo program. Um, as we also know, uh, Nixon kind of cancels actually the last few missions of the Apollo program. Um, and uh, the budget of NASA declines significantly, although it stabilizes roughly around the 80s. And where we are today is an agency that has a multiplicity of missions, missions that don't just go out to the moon, that go out to Mars robotically, that also go out to, uh, you know, this week is the last week that we're operating Cassini around Saturn, um, and also out to Pluto, also uh, space telescopes that look for planets around other stars. NASA has evolved and actually expanded its mission portfolio beyond actually just that mission to the moon. And I think one additional thing that's different today is that back in the 60s, it was clear that that next step was boots on the lunar surface to prove who would win. Um, and that was the vision, quote unquote. But today, there are many visions. Some people focus on visions for commercial space activity in low Earth orbit. Other people focus on visions for lunar development, for long-term habitation on the lunar surface for whatever reasons they have. Other people focus on uh, missions to Mars with humans, others on missions to go and sail boats on the oceans of Titan, and other people yet still on how to send small microchip satellites to Alpha Centauri. And that multiplicity of motivations, I think, is what's fundamentally different. And I think today, we think about how to select our missions that achieve both leadership and, and scientific advancement, but also how to enable the visions and the missions of others. Jacqueline. Kennedy in his speech also challenged the United States to become the leading space-faring nation. Today, the U.S. cannot send its own astronauts up uh, into space. We have to rely on the Russians. We also rely on a Russian-built rocket engine to launch some of our payloads. So have we lived up to Kennedy's challenge to be the world's greatest spacefaring nation? Can we start with you, Alex? 
Sure. I mean, you know, thankfully, uh, our, 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 uh, the Russian rocket worked just well about 15 minutes ago, and astronauts Van de Heijen and Kabo are on their way to the National Space Station on Expedition 53. Um, and so, you know, that is a partnership that has been very effective. Um, and, and I think, again, back to the multiplicity of the mission, uh, that's only one vector uh, on, on exploration space technology. Uh, it was very clear to the world who took the first picture of Pluto. It was very clear to the world who landed a you know, small jeep-sized vehicle on the Martian surface with the rather incredible sky crane system. Right? These are also symbols of American leadership. And as we are scheduled to launch Americans for American soil again in the next couple years on the commercial crew vehicles, um, I think that will very clearly signal leadership as well, as I might add are the ability of some of those first stages um, to return down to Earth and land. If, if we have this, this partnership with the Russians that is working so well, is it important to pursue a, a manned space program? John, if you want to weigh in. Well, first of all, the people that the Russians launch are going to a U.S.-dominated space station. I mean, what we're doing is buying taxi service. That sh really shouldn't affect a perception of where the U.S. is, since it's a U.S.-dominated 75% uh, funded facility that they're going to. Um, and we will restore our capability to launch U.S. astronauts from U.S. soil on U.S. built uh, uh, spacecraft and rockets within the next year or two. So this has been a temporary pause, not, not an abrogation of leadership. Uh, is it important to continue to have a human space program? The memo that went to Kennedy recommending setting Apollo as a national goal, said it is men not merely, well, you know, this was before consciousness was raised. It was <laughs> men not merely machines that captures the imagination of the world. I think that's still valid today. Uh, we may not be able to identify individual astronauts, but the idea that people have been living permanently in space since 2000, uh, that, that, uh, there is an opportunity coming for a broader range of people to travel into space. Those are all still very important elements of, of, of a future vision. Maybe, you know, I want to make this interactive. And uh, are there questions from the audience? I think there are mics that can be passed around the room. Does anybody want to ask the panel a question here in the front? Uh, yeah, the mic is coming. Wait, they'll bring you a mic. So you don't have to shout. Right here. Hi. Uh, the president nominated a new director for NASA last week. I wanted the panel's thoughts on him. His name is uh, Jim Bridenstine, I think yep. I'm pronouncing that correctly. He's a congressman from Oklahoma. OK. That's not a historical question. <laughs> so we'll all get in trouble. I mean, uh, uh, I've been talking to the media, including Jacqueline, with positive words for Mr. Bridenstine. Uh, everybody that's interacted with him say he's level-headed, pragmatic, thoughtful, has given a lot of attention to what is needed for a good future space program. Uh, so uh, I think he is um, a, a perfectly reasonable choice. The uh, fact that he's, quote, a politician, unquote, I think is irrelevant. Uh, and the criticism comes from politicians. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, he, he's a man, first of all, he obviously wants the job. He's, he's spent the past couple of years preparing for it. And uh, I think he deserves a chance. You probably don't want to wait. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, uh, I will say, of course, though, that you know, we're happy to see a nomination go forward and look forward to expeditious consideration by the Senate. And <laughs> you know, it, it, by the way, historically, uh, Robert Lightfoot has been acting administrator of NASA for longer than anybody else has been in that role. Yeah. So it's about time to get a new leader. Well, uh, Tiesel, maybe the next question we could start with you. Uh, one of the things, uh, as I mentioned at the outset, that, that I think sometimes we appreciate, but, but often we also forget, is the impact the space program has had on our lives. Mm -hmm. on our economy, on, you know, things that we do in our daily lives that I think we sort of forget about. Um, let's talk a little bit about, number one, what those 
advances are, and maybe some that we're not thinking of. I mean, you know, I think there's the obvious ones. Everybody talks about Velcro, and everybody talks about the powdered drink tang. I remember drinking that as a kid. The freeze-dried ice cream, which is awful. Um, but the impact the program has had on, on America, not just the space program, but America writ large. And then maybe we could also talk about what we might expect to see in this second age, uh, or second chapter, if you will, of the space age. So what have we gotten out of it? All right, so usually people talk about spin-offs and they think of uh, technology, wonderful ways that the space program has contributed to technological development, scientific advancement. Um, but one of the important areas of spin-offs that I, I'm interested in is um, political spin-offs. <laughs> uh, the Apollo program definitely had quite a few, and so obviously proposed by President Kennedy, and he had certain expectations about um, the political rewards that would be reaped from that, that type of program. But when um, Nixon became president, he, he really um, took advantage of the popularity of of the Apollo program, especially to support his, his um, foreign relations agenda. And one of the stories I really like is that shortly after um, the Apollo 11 crew returned from the moon, he spoke with them and he said um, he was so excited because the first lunar landing was, um, it helped him get a meeting with um, uh, Nicola Ceausescu of Romania. And he said that he'd been trying forever to get an appointment, but that the popularity of the first lunar landing got it for him, and um, and he said that 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 was worth everything we spent on the space program, which <laughs> is an overstatement, perhaps. But what that meeting did was um, it helped um, eventually contribute to uh, improving relations with China. So he met um, with Ceausescu to to say that he was interested in in um, starting to open up um, conversation with China and, and uh, advance that forward. And there are a number of different examples that. Um, especially during the Nixon administration, of ways that he was able to utilize the popularity of the program to um, advance some of his interests abroad. So I'd say when we think about spin-offs, we have to move beyond technological spin-offs and think of some of the other areas that the space program has impacted um, the country's, I don't know, experience and standing. Well, I mean, what, what, what about the economic impact? Um, yeah. You're an economist. Sure. I mean, you know, we still haven't really improved as economists too much on the solar growth model, which basically says that kind of 50% of long run GDP growth in this country is determined by technological change. And so investments in technology, which is what investments in the space program are, are a fundamentally important way to continue to grow our economy and grow our capabilities and our productions. Um, but specifically to the kind of Kennedy speech, one of the things that I, 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 I was uh, interested in uh, listening to it today was he mentions two other programs. He mentions the uh, Mariner probe on the way to Venus that was on the way to Venus at the time of the speech. But he also mentions the TIROS program, um, which was, of course, one of the early weather monitoring satellite programs. And he also mentioned the transit program, which was an early uh, naval ship tracking program, which, of course, we now know kind of as the GPS system. And so, you know, the, the base that was laid in terms of the technologies that today we now take for granted, like GPS, like remote sensing satellites, um, I think really has, has contributed to, as we know, a multi-hundred billion dollar global space economy. And of course, NASA also played a significant role in uh, ensuring a kind of competitive market in communication satellites as well. And so really the whole gamut was kind of laid in that 1960s period. Yeah, one thing that Kennedy doesn't usually get credit for is setting up the framework for uh, bringing communication satellites into operation, like creating ComSat and then Intelsat in the 60s, um, that first steps in global communication, which you know, the world could not live today without communication satellites. They link the world together. Uh, this broadcast couldn't operate without uh, satellite streaming. So uh, that was a very specific Kennedy initiative uh, to, to choose a path on how to bring those satellites into operation. Well, you know, I, on that point, I mean, if you look at the first spy satellite, it was in 1960, I think. You'll, you'll correct me if I'm wrong. Um, <laughs> but you're right. <laughs> um, the first successful satellite. Uh, right, the first orbiting satellite, uh, U.S. satellite. So, but now, fast forward 55 plus years, and, you know, I think it's 90% I've seen figures of the satellite imagery, or at least the foundational imagery that the U.S. government spy agencies rely on 
are commercial images, so from private companies like the Digital Globe. Um, you mentioned GPS, you mentioned you know, communications via satellite. Try to look in your crystal ball a little bit. We now have more investment in some of these very things, but also some new things. 10, 20 years from now, um, are there things we can expect that will be different about our lives because of investments in space? I mean, some people talk about artificial intelligence, that a lot of the, the inherent technologies in the space community are also fueling that, that new um, era of science. Maybe we could start with, we'll start at the end, Alex. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of ways, you know, one could take that. I mean, one of the things that occurs to me is certainly, um, you know, any mission to, to Mars, even just to orbit Mars, is a very long mission, and you're going to have a significant uh, period of time where, uh, A, you're, you're tens of minutes away from communicating with anyone on Earth, and you're certainly a very long time away from getting any medical need. And so there will have to be very significant thought about how to have very uh, low mass, low energy requirement medical devices, um, and also to think about uh, medical care in, frankly, really remote areas, of which there remain many on the planet. Um, and so I think that's one area. Uh, one, given that we just you know, are having the, the Expedition 53 launch, it's a very small one. It's a very small way in, life could, in which life could be different. But on this crew increment, there's going to be one of uh, the experiments that I'm most interested in, which is an experiment by a company called Made in Space to try to manufacture uh, f doped fiber optic cables in, in microgravity to basically have increased transparency for fiber optic cables. Um, we did some experiments on this in the 80s. Um, results were promising. Um, so private companies now, actually a multiplicity of them, three of them are actually you know, undertaking projects to try to figure out how to make better fiber optic cables. Again, that's really only something I mentioned because it's you know, going to be in this crew increment that the astronauts were launched on today. But it's you know, one of those many ways that people don't really ever talk about, um, but which the kind of people who are working on advancing technology and space exploration kind of uh, you know, do every day. Well, and I think we're back in an era like Apple Computer of young people in their garages thinking of new things to do in space or new ways of doing things in space. That the outcome, the results of which are really very hard to predict. But, but uh, the emergence of small satellites, of lower cost launch vehicles have, have opened up and, 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 uh, and a, a third generation of space enthusiasts have opened up the arena of space to all kinds of innovative experiments. They won't all succeed, but some will probably with unforeseen consequences. And, and I should add that, you know, if some of the companies that are pursuing um, commercial space flight are able to provide services even for suborbital space flight at a cost that people can afford, we're going to have a radically changed social environment uh, in terms of who has been to space and storytelling about space. Right, you know, at a very base level, uh, you're much more likely to go to a party with someone who's been to space, right? You know, and so that's that's a way in which your life could be demonstrably different. We've got a question over there. Please, uh, you want to wait for a mic? Can we get a mic up here in the second row? I'm jealous of all the young people in this room because I thought I would be going to space decades ago. Now the only way I'm going to get there is in a can, <laughs> my ashes. I, want, I challenge the audience to think of two words, logical and reasonable or plausible. I challenge all of you to think about those words to help the enormous number of humans on this planet who are living in Stone Age conditions through a lack of leadership, among other things. It breaks my heart. Is there a question there? Yes. Okay. And how can space help solve some of these problems and also disaster response? You know, there are millions of people in Florida without power probably for weeks. So I think we need to be logical about our goals and then look at what's plausible. Well, Thank a case you. study on what can be done is the country of India, which is using its space capability for education, for medicine, 
for resource, for disaster warning, for disaster mitigation. Uh, it, it's, a, say, a, a, a case study in how space capabilities can help a country uh, in an early stage of, of economic development. Uh, and you know, most of the world, at least a third of the world below the uh, equator doesn't have access to internet with all of the capabilities that internet gives uh, to humans. Uh, satellites are an important part of bringing that capability to the part of the world that doesn't have it. So there's lots of things that can be done. Uh, it takes will, will take some money, uh, and it will take uh, a collaboration. Um, so it's out there to be uh, taken advantage of. Can America lead? Of course. Will it? Let's see. So, Teasel, maybe um, to build off the question, um, give us a sense. I mean, you mentioned that there's a lot of historic legacies of the space program. And you mentioned one that I thought was very interesting. And being Politico, to hear about the political implications or the political breakthroughs that may have occurred because of that, that vision and the sort of the global really obsession, if you will, with what America was doing in those years. Um, has there been a humanitarian benefit to some of the space investments we made over the decades? You know, if so, are, you know, give us a few examples of that. I think that gets a little bit of his question, too. There definitely has been. I, I'm not the right person to speak to that, though. I don't, I don't know um, many cases in, in depth, but um, there are many examples. Um, especially more recently of Earth applications that have, that have helped with development. Um, there's the, is it the ATS um, satellite program with India that um, uh, broadcasts educational television programming to um, rural uh, villages throughout India. Um, so, a, and that was in the 70s, I believe. So even then there was um, those types of programs. And, and what I'll mention for NASA is the NASA Severe program. And the NASA Severe program basically sets up offices um, around the world in countries that uh, can benefit from its uh, earth science data and actually trains people on how to use that data to improve agricultural yields, to imp improve flood resistance, all this kind of stuff. Um, Severe is actually one of our most successful and continually growing uh, programs with offices in, in Niger, in Nepal, uh, a number that you know, aren't on top of, tip of my tongue, but uh, it's really shown to have really significant effects in those regions. Let, let me give a much more immediate example, which is Irma, Jose. I mean, without satellites, we wouldn't have seen them coming. We couldn't have warned people to do what they could do to get out of the way. Uh, the absence now of connectivity shows how important connectivity is. Uh, so, I mean, we, we have a very immediate demonstration of the social value of space capability in just the past few days. Mm -hmm. Might have time for one quick last question, I think, before we run out of time um, here in the second row. There's no mic. I think we should close it now. I think. In um, 1977, Ken Olson, from uh, the founder of Digital Equipment Corporation, made a prediction uh, saying that there is no reason anybody would want a, pr a computer in their home. And that's considered one of the worst technological predictions of all times. <laughs> now, think about what if we would replace the word computer with satellite, and in light of the proliferation of small satellite, small satellite technology, would you also consider that if you would make that statement, there is no reason anybody would want a personal satellite? Would you also consider that one of the worst technology predictions? Let's do it quickly. Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we've already had companies that have done that, right? You've already had companies that are basically selling exactly that. Um, you know, the company that became Spire started out as someone who was selling, you know, time on a satellite. You could do whatever the heck you wanted with it. You know, you want to, I mean, limited capability, uh, since it didn't have a lot of imagery capabilities, in fact, none. But, you know, you could, uh, uh, you could, you could run code on it if you wanted. And, but that's the idea, right? It's the idea. And I think, frankly, uh, all you need to do is expand that out to say who wants their own spaceship. And I think it's very clear that a lot of people uh, would definitely have some use uh, for something that could uh, go into space on a weekend.
Crazy, yes or no? Crazy, yes or no? Personal satellite. I'll say no. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe. <laughs> good academic answer. Well, I think that's, I think that's but, a, per a perfect way, maybe. I, I don't think the res or I hope the result of the proliferation of satellites is not beltway-like traffic jams <laughs> in orbit, uh, which is an issue, by the way. Well, awesome. Thank you so much to all of our great panelists for being here. I think we've laid a really good foundation for where we've been. Our second... <laughs> So our second panel is going to be a look at where we're going. But before we get to that, I want to thank our sponsor, Digital Globe, again. And here to say a few words uh, from Digital Globe is Walter Scott, the executive vice president and founder, chief technical officer, and executive leader. Sounds good. All right. Well, thanks very much. <laughs> Appreciate the opportunity. I'm, I'm very much a child of the space age. Um, it was uh, the entrepreneurial spirit of the, uh, the early um, failures and successes uh, that really set my career on its current trajectory. Um, I was uh, one of those people who watched the moon landings on uh, black and white television in my grandmother's apartment. Uh, just out of curiosity, how many of you here in the audience um, have actually done, did that? I know John, okay, wow. There's actually more people here who have that personal experience than I had thought. Um, and that was something that was really inspiring for me. Um, that was one of the key elements of uh, my, uh, my decision to start Digital Globe. Another one was uh, I, I spent time uh, early in my career at the Lawrence Livermore National Lab uh, in strategic defense. And in the course of that, learned a lot about many of the technologies that form the foundation for companies that you're seeing today that are um, emerging as commercial space. But it also gave me a ringside seat to the, uh, to the Cold War and the ending of the Cold War and how one of the things that kept the Cold War cold was the ability to observe from space. It meant that it was possible for us to act on the basis of facts instead of on the basis of fears. And that global transparency was one of the things that uh, combined with the experience in satellite technology, combined with the enthusiasm for that entrepreneurial aspect of space uh, that led me to found Digital Globe on the principle of creating that global transparency and enabling people to see a better world. Well, that's very much in line with uh, the views that President Kennedy announced when he talked about wanting space to be a place for instruments of knowledge and understanding. Uh, and moving the clock forward a bit, um, space is hard. Uh, Digital Globe had its first two satellites uh, fail, uh, one after the other. Um, and people say that I'm more stubborn than smart, so I kept going. But part of that was also realization that it was an important goal, very much like what President Kennedy said about the goal of going to the moon. Uh, it was a goal that was important enough that uh, it, was worth, it was worth progressing. And I think I actually have the words that he used uh, in describing it. It was um, a goal to serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills because the challenge is one we are willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one which we intend to win. So we kept going. And now roll the clock forward, and uh, the earlier panel, I think, touched on the subject of how space can be beneficial to all of us. Well, satellite imagery that you use for your online maps to find your way around the traffic jams in Washington, D.C., uh, we're responsible for the maps, not the traffic jams. <laughs> the maps basically come from Digital Globe, the underlying imagery that's used to make the maps and that you see on your satellite phone. Uh, another example is uh, we support the U.S. government. I heard earlier a comment about 90% of the foundation uh, imagery used by the U.S. government comes from Digital Globe. It's unclassified. It's shareable with allies and coalition partners and first responders. You're actually seeing here a, uh, uh, a uh, parachutist, special forces operator, jumping out of an airplane with Digital Globe-provided satellite imagery on their ruggedized version of an iPhone. 
Another example is uh, supporting the Gates Foundation in eradicating polio by mapping dwellings around the world. Think about it. How do you deliver a polio vaccine? Well, you have to know like, where to send it. It's not like a lot of the developing world has addresses where you can go look in a phone book and say, well, I need to deliver 45 vaccines. People don't even know where the cities are. So using satellite imagery, we were able to map the developing world to enable the Gates Foundation to deliver the right amount of vaccine to the right people. Interestingly enough, um, touching on another point, it turns out Facebook is using the same technology to figure out where people in the developing world live so that they can connect them to the internet. Now another example is using satellite imagery again provided by Digital Globe supporting the Satellite Sentinel project in identifying areas where atrocities were occurring uh, in the uh, split between Sudan and South Sudan as a way of uh, holding people accountable for war crimes. Yet another example, uh, let's say you want to figure out for a particular piece of property, how tall is the building, where are the trees nearby, is your swimming pool, solar panel, the old days, you'd go drive by. Maybe you'd pick up the phone and you'd tell somebody what it was. But how about you want to do that for the entire continent of Australia with 7.5 million square kilometers uh, and a number of dwellings that's somewhere between 15 and 20 million? Well, we're actually using satellite imagery to find all of that at a fraction of the cost of what you would use for people on the ground. And maybe a more human element uh, you may remember a couple of years ago, the Associated Press uh, released a story on seafood from slaves, where there were slave fishing networks, that is, networks of captains who enslaved uh, men, sometimes for many years in horrible conditions. And uh, they would catch fish, and then they would offload those to a commercial uh, large refrigerated fishing shipping boat, and they would inject themselves into our food supply. And we provided a smoking gun, which is that satellite image that showed the offloading in process, and that was used to generate a series of arrests, and more importantly, to uh, release over 2,000 slaves and reunite them with their families. So this is an example of how space, in many respects inspired by what happened in the 1960s, the moon program, uh, has led to benefits for people around the world. Well. We're seeing a resurgence of uh, interest in commercial space. And in order to enable that sort of interest to progress, whether it's commercial launch, uh, commercial weather, commercial satellite servicing, space situational awareness, or remote sensing, we need a policy environment that is um, supportive, that is supportive of innovation. Unfortunately, um, back in 1992, Congress introduced the, the 1992 Land Remote Sensing Policy Act, which was very visionary, very forward-leaning, and spoke of assuring um, American leadership in space. The practice, however, has been not so much. The, uh, uh, the whole radar, commercial radar industry ended up going offshore outside the United States, largely because it wasn't possible to make it through the regulatory process in the US. Uh, back in 1999, Digital Globe asked for the ability to make its highest resolution imagery available. We got that permission in 2014. We have typically spent months waiting for approval to sell imagery to foreign customers. And the example here, which, let's see if I can go back. There we go. So this is what, this is what a forest fire looks like from space. And if, you, if you've been following the news, you get forest fires across the western United States on a regular basis. I live in Colorado. It's a big deal for us. Um, actually, this last week, the skies were darkened with smoke from wildfires burning all across the western United States. Well, Worldview 3, or one of our last, uh, next to last satellites, is able to see through the smoke. Uh, using shortwave infrared. But we've been waiting for about three years before we've been able to get approval to make our highest resolution shortwave infrared data available. Now, this is not a good environment for in supporting innovation. Now, fortunately, Congress, um, in particular the House Science, Space, and Technology Committee, uh, recently passed 
the American Space, Co the American Space Commerce Free Enterprise Act of 2017 uh, was strong bipartisan support uh, with uh, Congressman uh, Smith, Babin, uh, Perlmutter, and Bridenstine. Bridenstine, of course, uh, being selected to be the next NASA administrator. And we're very pleased to see somebody who is as forward-leaning as Congressman Bridenstine uh, taking on that role. So we're hopeful that with that sort of a push in place, it will create an environment that will allow for the United States not just to have achieved the status of being the leading spacefaring nation, but in a world in which dozens of countries are launching hundreds of satellites and rapidly gaining on that leadership, slowing down isn't the right way to maintain a lead. Speeding up is instead. And I look forward to that. And in our next discussion on policy, hopefully we'll explore some of those themes. Thank you very much. And thanks, everybody, for staying in your seats and not leaving. Um, without further delay, I'm going to introduce our second panel. I think this is going to be another interesting conversation. Um, and unlike the last one, probably much more forward-looking on where we go from here. Um, our first panelist is Richard DeBello, who is Vice President of Business Development of Virgin Galactic and also former space policy official at both the Pentagon and the White House. I feel like a debutante. <laughs> <laughs> you are. Uh, <laughs> next up is Jamie Morin, who is Vice President and Executive Director of the Center for Space Policy and Strategy at the Aerospace Corporation which is a federally funded research and development center, <coughs> which is a long term. Uh, it took me a long time to learn that. I just thought corporation, corporation. Uh, and we're pleased, very pleased to have Secretary Heather Wilson, who is the principal space advisor at the Department of Defense. She's also a former congresswoman from New Mexico. And word is that she has another big job in the Pentagon too, but I forget what that one is. <laughs> Uh, Bob Richards is founder and CEO of Moon Express, the only company uh, that has a U.S. government license to go to the moon. And finally, uh, last but not least, Eric Stalmer, president of the Commercial F Space Flight Foundation. Mm -hmm. Federation. Uh, Federation. Sorry. Like Star Trek. Eric is also an Army Reserve officer <laughs> and a combat veteran of the Iraq War. Um, Thanks to all of you for being here. Um, I'm really interested in this conversation because I think all of you represent very different vantage points on this issue of space. Some of you are focused on commercial space travel. Uh, others, mining or, you know, private exploration of the moon. Obviously, Secretary Wilson, Jamie, your roles, your backgrounds is much more focused on the national security piece of space how to use space technology to defend the country from, from adversaries. And, you know, all of those areas represent, as we all know, very complicated questions about policy, about budget, um, about regulation. And I think the overall theme on all of those questions is what is the government's role? Uh, obviously, the government has driven a lot of the space juggernaut, if you will, up until now. Um, what is the role of private industry, which is growing in leaps and bounds, uh, the private funded space uh, ventures? And, you know, and how can the government play a role both in overseeing the, the private sector, um, in regulating it, but also encouraging it? As, as we all know, there's a lot of investment in this area and, and more and more sort of market-based approaches to pushing the envelope in space. Um, so, you know, maybe we'll start out uh, with you, Secretary Wilson. Um, in this brave new world, in this sort of inflection point that we are upon when it comes to space policy, from where you sit in the Pentagon, what do you see as the, the primary one or two policy issues that need to be dealt with on a first order? In other words, what is facing us or facing you as the principal DOD space advisor in terms of an issue of real importance, a challenge of real importance that the government um, needs to address. 
let me let me postulate that, that that's driven by the world that we're seeing and the and the evolution that we're seeing. And let me postulate something here. So it's 55 years since Kennedy's speech. When we're here at the centenary of his speech, I think that space um, will be a common domain for human endeavor. It will be a common domain for human endeavor and it's driven by two things. The first is the decline in the cost of launch. So it'll go from tens of thousands of dollars per pound to get something in space to hundreds of dollars per pound to get something in space. And the second thing is miniaturization of the technology. So the payloads are getting smaller and the cost per pound is also getting smaller. So it becomes much more possible to do a lot more things. So more players can do more things from space. So it will be more congested. It will be potentially more contested. So that has implications for what we can do and then how do we defend it. Um, I think that space will become more like the oceans where there are multiple players there are some states there, there are private corporations, there are private individuals. And there will be either by agreement or by common practice, um, uh, kind of, it will be an ungoverned area like the sea, um, but where there are common practices and perhaps agreements on appropriate behavior. And there will also be countries and allies who protect uh, the freedom of operation in space. I think that's our big challenge, is to move very rapidly toward that world. Well, let's go to the rest of the panel on this, this future that you sketch out. Um, assuming that that is the, the environment that, that most spacefaring individuals, countries will, will want to see, because it seems like we have a fairly good construct when it comes to the oceans. What are the things that need to be done to speedily start getting on that road that Secretary Wilson talks about. Maybe we could, we could start at the end with Eric. I think uh, the continued partnership with the commercial sector and the government, working with each other, uh, understand the various rules of the road, understand capabilities, uh, what the commercial sector can offer. Uh, and as the Secretary pointed out, it, it's an enormous amount that the commercial sector brings to the table. Uh, it, when you look at the, uh, what is going on in launch, and the, the tremendous reduction in cost and launch, the miniaturization of what we're seeing with uh, in the remote sensing uh, world and the satellite communication world, um, but bringing that cost down. And, and I think the government as a partner in a lot of ways, and I'm not saying, you know, depending on the government for these huge contracts, you know, it, it's, a it's a matter of the government working with and understanding what the, the speed of need of industry is. And, uh, you know, you, you mentioned uh, promoting that's the FAA's Office of Commercial Space Transportation is doing a great job. Their, their role, it's dual-hatted, is to promote the industry as well as protect, you know, the general public. And I think they do an outstanding role in that. And it's to continue to work with them on these regulatory issues, areas that we need reform. Uh, how, do we, how do we embrace this? How do we work with uh, Congress on it? The, right now, I think something near and dear to, to uh, Digital Globe and, and all the remote sensing companies is the regulations that, that govern the rem remote sensing uh, world. I think they date back to 1992. So Congress is working hard to, to kind of update uh, and enhance these, these regulations, working with industry on what is, what is the right fit. And I think that's a great start. Uh, Richard, uh, Richard, to get onto this, this, this path that Secretary Wilson laid out, what do you see as, as the big looming issue that needs to so be addressed, or issues? So the Secretary made two very good points. It's the the, the, the collapse of, of cost of access to space and the miniaturization. So exponential technologies are driving, are dematerializing hardware into software, are, are making smaller and smaller systems that where, where the realm of the governments in space is now accessible to the realm of private industry. Uh, we're seeing a, 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 cognitive, a cognitive shift, not just a paradigm shift, but a cognitive shift with um, young people seeing that they can do this too. And, and what we're looking at now is, is as, as CubeSats transform access uh, to low Earth orbit, we're now looking at exploration going beyond Earth orbit and to the moon. And uh, as you mentioned as I, as I came in, 
the biggest barrier we have had was not technological, it's not financial, it was regulatory. And we hit a, we hit a barrier here in this town. I didn't realize when I started blazing a trail to the moon that I needed to blaze a trail through Washington, D.C. as well in order to come up with a regulatory framework in cooperation with the agencies that didn't exist. And I'm happy to see that we found a way, but we need a permanence uh, in order to make sure that we have freedom of enterprise and space. Jamie, uh, from your point of view, how does, how does the government working with industry create that future space world that the Secretary lays out, but also at the same time protects the national security interests? Because clearly the U.S. military, foreign militaries have, have a, a big stake, perhaps the biggest stake in all of this. And as the Secretary also alluded to, there's likely to be competition in space, mm. and that competition could play out uh, in military terms. So how does, the, how does the government ensure that it can protect the national security priorities in space, allow that other stuff to flourish, and not get into a war in space either? So it's an extraordinarily important balancing act. And I think the, really the dominant phenomenon that we're seeing in space right now and it's underpinned by the technological developments that Secretary Wilson spoke about, is a democratization. It's a lowering of barriers. It's an opening to players who may not be inculcated into the same norms that underpinned the action of great powers with major government-backed programs. And you see that with dozens of spacefaring nations now, if you call launching a CubeSat being a spacefaring nation, which I think is fair. So it's a, it's a dramatic broadening of the players and that makes leadership truly essential and it's leadership that has to be on an international scale right we need a clear vision for where the United States needs to go that includes a regulatory framework that balances national security exploration and economic imperatives but it is it has to be one that is carried out on an international scale because space, it does have some critical attributes of a global commons in which uh, you know, one or two bad actors can befoul the entire domain for everybody that comes after. Richard, to you, Bob mentioned not realizing how much he had to blaze a trail through Washington to get to the moon. Um, <clears throat> what do you see as your biggest challenge when it comes to the Washington policymaking world in sort of pushing the envelope and achieving some of the big objectives that your company has laid out? I, I think as the, um, as the commercial sector has become more capable and taken on more projects, I think the question ha always arises is where are the proper roles of the government vis-a-vis -vis the, the private sector? We saw this big shift happen um, maybe a decade ago when the government realized it could rely on the private sector almost completely for broadband communication. So a lot of communications used by the military as unprotected comms. It's the, same, it's the same communication that Fox and CNN use to move signals around the world. So I think it's a maturity, and I think we're seeing it now in launch vehicles with the introduction of SpaceX and then eventually Blue and other, people's coming, other people coming in into the, the, uh, the scene. And I think that's one of the, the biggest issues, and there's always a little bit of pulling and tugging when that happens. There are people who argue, well, the government needs to stop doing this because we're going to start. And there are other people who say, well, hold it. Um, you know, we have to, the government has to do this because it needs to have assurance. So that kind of dialogue has been playing out. We've seen it in remote sensing. We've seen it in launch. We've seen it in communications. And now with the tremendous explosion that all the panelists have described, we're, we're seeing a whole lot of uh, small companies try everything from communications to remote sensing to synthet synthetic aperture radar. Um, to uh, really basically commercial signal intelligence. I mean, there's just a proliferation of ideas uh, out there, which all of which leads back to the uh, big problem that Jamie mentioned, which is uh, managing this is going to be exponentially harder. Um, and we're having a hard time in the United States getting our arms around how do we manage it, how do we license it, what's, is, is the government supposed to be prescriptive or should it take a light touch? And then when you look, you take two steps back and you look, this is happening globally. We have no air traffic system for the globe right now. We have no space traffic system for the globe. Right now the Air Force is acting as the de facto space traffic cop. And it's, it's more of a job 
and as we proliferate these small satellites, it's more of a job than they can handle on a part-time basis. So we've got to get serious uh, going forward. We've got to get serious of how we want to manage it, not as the United States, although we should be you know, an indispensable part of the solution, but as the, as the, globe, as the globe. Rich, if I can just reinforce one of your points there. I think uh, as a guy that used to have to balance the resource portfolio, for the Department of Defense. I think the single biggest thing that government can do is think of themselves simultaneously as a regulator and also a <coughs> consumer in space. And when it comes to the consumer piece, think in portfolio terms. There are cases where the government needs exquisite capability that are un <coughs> have no parallel anywhere in the commercial world, but it is not the entirety. And in almost any mission area, you can subdivide it. And there is oftentimes a more efficient portfolio outcome where you rely on commercial services with high quantity, delivering quality and inexpensiveness, and then a niche of exceptionally, uh, you know, exceptionally capable services that you need for war winning capability and the like. And that applies in many other areas as well. Yeah, you mentioned regulator and consumer. I would say the government also plays two more roles, and that is partner and defender. Mm -hmm. And on the partner side, the most obvious one is, is, is there anyone here who has not used that blue dot on your phone, Uber, Lyft, or anything in the last, raise your hand if you haven't looked at the blue dot on your phone in last week. There's one, two. <laughs> Luddites. Okay. <laughs> so that. Show them the door. It was a, GPS was originally a Navy experiment was then brought over to the Air Force, 31 satellites operated by 40 22-year-olds on average uh, who live in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And we provide a GPS for the world. A, for a billion people every day use GPS. And it's, uh, it's operated by a squadron of 40 people in the United States Air Force in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Just think of the industries terrestrially that have been enabled by that technology and how it's changed our lives. Um, that's what a, a, par a very effective partnership between a service, almost a utility, provided by the United States Air Force and then hundreds of companies that have used it to provide services to people. I think it's, it's, in, it's probably the most, one of the most remarkable inventions that's changed our lives. Well, great. So this sort of leads into our, our next question about government regulation in space and specifically traffic management in space. Um, there is no FAA for space. I feel like you sort of alluded to this, Richard. Can you talk about if there should be an FAA for space, and if so, what that, what that model should look like? Well, if you think of the closest parallel, which is air traffic control. So you have a system that grew up where nations were responsible for their own their own boundaries. And then they wanted rules for what happens between nations, so they created an international organization called ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization, whose responsibilities are mostly, mostly to help nations coordinate those boundaries. We don't have anything like that structure today. First of all, I mean, we're still putting together the basic tool set. I don't want to sound like I'm bad-mouthing the Air Force here, but I mean, we're, ahead, really, we're, we're really at a rudimentary level in terms of our ability to see what's going on in space. So, I mean, a fundamental, uh, a fundamental uh, component of being able to manage anything is you have to have awareness of what's going on. So I think we're, where, we are, where we are realistically on the scale is that we're getting better at that first part. We're getting better at understanding what's going on. We can see low Earth orbit better than we can see the geostationary orbit, but there's a lot of work to do. And then, you, then when you look beyond it, in the past, there was a concern primarily, I think it was born out of NASA and uh, NASA Johnson when they were building the space station. They began to worry about what happens if there's a lot of debris in low Earth orbit and we have humans in a space station. And um, one passionate person, Nick Johnson, sort of took this on as his crusade. And as a result, the international community ended up coming up uh, maybe 20 years ago with the uh, IADC guidelines, which are sort of the very basic template for how you should operate in space. As the secretary mentioned, we are, it's really important that we have a more sophisticated dialogue with the world about rules of the road. 
So two things, I, in brief, two things. One, we've, technically we've got to get better at figuring out what's going on and who's doing what. And two, we need, to, we need, and this can only be done in an international dialogue, we need some kind of much more sophisticated understanding of how nations are going to talk to each other about what's going on in space. And this, this isn't referencing military to military. This is just all the commercial activity that's going on now. The military dimension, which I'll defer to the secretary on, is, is equally as complicated. In fact, the Air Force did kind of take on that role. We were, we were kind of the, the, the leader for the, the United States on, on space, and we took over the, uh, the obligation to keep the catalog. And we share that with every commercial provider if there is a risk of a, of a commercial satellite or another nation's satellite being bumped by debris. There is a lot, it, one of the things that's, um, that's different about space is that it's becoming more congested. Uh, and so it is, uh, it, it is congested, it is likely to be contested, and there are large numbers of objects that are flying around um, that, we, that are too small for us to really track with fidelity. Um, but part of our budget this year and next year is to increase our what we call space situational awareness so that we, we have a better catalog um, of what is uh, in space and more um, and, and not just a catalog. If, if something moves its orbit and more people are doing that, um, we, need to, we need to be able to know so it doesn't hit your satellite. So more near real-time situational awareness. Well, let me build off that a little bit. Um, you make the analogy to the FAA for sort of air traffic control. But is there an international model out there, whether it's tracking earthquakes or seismic activity? I mean, is there an international model, an international body that could serve as sort of the overall, not police force, if you will, but that mechanism where countries can come together and agree to cooperate on advancing the situational awareness, but then also coming up with some more rules of the road? I think there could be in time. I think it u needs the U.S. leadership. I think we need to uh, set forth a framework. Uh, and back to Jessica's, you know, original question, you know, whether it's going to be a government agency, as much as I love uh, the government and the, the partnership that we have, I cringe a little bit about starting a new, you know, government agency or some sort <coughs> of um, aspect of that to address this issue, especially if they do not leverage the commercial marketplace. I know firsthand of commercial companies that, that just specialize in space traffic management and in rendezvous operations and what is going on in space and can really enhances uh, the mission of the DOD on, on what they see in space. And if that partnership is not leveraged, we, we might as well go back, just give it back to the Air Force because they really have to, you know, engage the, with these commercial providers that are really leaning forward that don't have these contractual constraints a lot of times. Uh, just to jump on what er Eric said, I, I know this is a political hot potato in Washington right now because if you go back to the, 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 you know, air traffic control, there's a big debate going on nationally about whether it should be privatized or corporatized or something like that. Uh, many nations have done that, including Canada, and they did it years ago. It's operating successfully. Uh, I don't want to get into that political debate, but on the point that Eric raised, I do believe strongly, as Eric said, that there's a tremendous amount of capability in the commercial sector, and this is a capability that could be born commercial. In other words, if you're going to do this management task, you ought to be thinking about we don't need to do a government, we, we probably don't need to do a large government institution that we will later commercialize. We know enough now that we should, this should be being born commercial. So Eric, you talked about sort of industry needing to, to play a role in these conversations. Another place where industry is being asked to play a role in the conversation is with the new National Space Council that the White House has revitalized um, with the goal to review United States government space policy including long-range goals and develop a strategy for national space activities. We're still waiting for some specifics on how this is actually going to come together, but what would you in industry like to see this Space Council do? What can it do to succeed in your eyes, and what does that success look like? I, I think it has to have all the players at the table, uh, certainly all the government players, and I th that will be made up of the council itself. But I think as you look at the, the role of the user advisory council, um, Look at all facets. Look at the launch side of the house, no, not your, your traditional, your, your more commercial models. Look at the spaceports and what they can offer. Um, 
a range of diversity really needs to be addressed on the council because that's, that's the way that the, the industry is shaping. Look at how much the industry has changed in the last 10, 12 years. Um, I just saw, just last week or two weeks ago, SpaceX launched uh, a, a very important payload. X-37. Yeah, yeah. I didn't want to say it out loud, but yes. That was <laughs> um, it's a secret. Yes, yeah, I'm very cautious on that. You put it out on Twitter. Yes. <laughs> You're doing great. So possibly one of the most important payloads uh, that our government has and possibly one of the most important payloads that SpaceX could have launched. Uh, that was their 40th mission, and they started uh, their first Falcon 9, I, I believe, was in uh, 2012. So they've launched 40 times in that short amount of time. Those different players like that, if you look at what Blue Origin is doing, Sierra Nevada Corporation, a lot of these companies that we weren't talking about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, 5 years ago, and he's putting a, a payload on the moon. You need to, that table needs to be big. The industry is getting bigger, the pie is getting bigger, uh, and we, you have to have many different voices. So, Bob, if, if Moon Express were to have a seat on that council, what would your advice be to them? So it is a global conversation. Um, I'm here in the United States because this is the place to get to the moon. I talked about freedom of enterprise in space. That, that doesn't mean anarchy either. Um, if, if I was in the commercial aviation sector, and I think it's a great metaphor, uh, I'd, I'd be talking about freedom of enterprise in the skies, but I still have to file a flight plan. And that's not just... Oh, you don't. Oh, I don't? No, not in America. I come from but Canada, I guess. No. You don't? You well, are. There, okay, fair enough. Get her card. Fair enough. There has to be some. <laughs> Can I get your card? So. So I have to declare, could I say I have to declare where I'm going in space? Nope. Oh, well, nope. I'm talking about space, I'm oh, sorry. sorry. So I'm not an aviator, Please. so I'm okay. really, this is like talking in front of Pavarotti here when you're, when you're this <laughs> is probably not a good idea. Right? A <laughs> I'll talk about space. Okay. okay. When we're going to the moon, mm -hmm. it's really important that we communicate where we're going and what we're going to be doing there. Not because we're inviting uh, oversight or regulatory, because we want to not only have due regard for global activities, uh, there'll become a time when we, want, when we want people to have due regard for us, right? So that freedom of enterprise is, is, is a two-way street. And, and business in space, as we expand the economic sphere of Earth outward to the moon and beyond, um, it'll become in the economic interest of the United States to protect that activity. Yeah. So that will be the type of conversation that I would have as I, if I was on that council. Um, I forget who alluded to it. Um, it might have been you, Richard. But the, the sort of pull and back and forth tug of war, if you will, that sometimes occurs between certain players in the space mm -hmm. industry and others, um, the more traditional, perhaps entrenched interests who have sort of been the primary providers of a lot of these services to the government, and then, of course, a lot of the new players that are braving this whole new world. Um, I'd be interested in your thoughts. Maybe we can start with you, Secretary Wilson. But how do you see that in political terms playing out? I mean, the SpaceX United Launch Alliance fight was pretty ugly. I mean, it had to go to court. Um, it wasn't very pleasant. And you get the impression that, that that could be just the beginning of more fights like that. I mean, from where you sit, the, the politics of this, is there a way to get beyond some of that fierce sort of elbowing of each other? Or, or is that just what the future is going to look like for a bit until this plays out? It's interesting. My, you know, my role is to organize, train, and equip forces and present them to combatant commanders. I also serve a role as an advisor on space to the Secretary of Defense. And, and to his credit, the Vice President has taken a real interest in space. And I'm really glad that he has said, you know, we're going to restart the Space Council to look at some of these issues that go beyond national security space. And I, um, I'm, uh, I'm glad he's done that. Kind of kudos to him for doing that. So, so from my perspective, I actually don't have to deal with the politics. Um, I have to present capabilities. And that means that we are tremendously benefited by a very competitive private sector that's providing things like this, you know, a CubeSat. Um, and, uh, and we can um, purchase communication services as well as have, a, have our own layer of, of protected communications for other things. Um, uh, and we can uh, buy launch rather than build rockets. Um, that is a very different circumstance to be in. And it's, you know, we're one of the consumers of those services. Um, we're a big one, but we're, we're, 
or we may not be the biggest one for, for fairly soon, which is kind of exciting too. So, so I don't worry too much about the politics. I know you do because that's the title of your magazine. But, um, <laughs> but <laughs> we're not the only ones who worry about it. Well, okay, but but it's there. This is a vibrant, competitive sector. Maybe it wasn't before, but it's not unlike telecommunications or energy or mining or anything else where, all right, let's, let's have the competition because everybody benefits if there's a vigorous mm -hmm. competition. Jamie, what, 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 what is your view? Is, there, is this push and pull, tug of war going to go on regardless in some areas, even as the two worlds kind of work together and, and create that world of competition? Of course. <laughs> uh, it strikes me that the, the challenge for the National Space Council and the, and the challenge for uh, inspirational leadership on space is this uh, invisibility of space, mm -hmm. right? At, in the 1960s, space had enormous energy, but it was extraordinarily exotic. Mm -hmm. It was very divorced from the day-to-day -day reality of most human beings on the planet. But it was exotic and infatuating, and we heard a lot about that in the first panel. Um, the challenge now is setting goals in space that contribute to improvement of the human condition largely are about things that are invisible, right? It's getting good GPS signals down to first responders mm -hmm. doing hurricane aftermath cleanup so that they can be as in efficient as possible in rescuing people. It's getting... Uh, radio frequencies up off of all of the sensors out there that are telling us where the, uh, where the, wa the water is rising. Mm -hmm. it's, it's invisible to the average American. It's invisible to the average person almost anywhere in the world. But we still need to inspire that excitement so that we get the talent we need to lead in, the area, in this area and so that we have the political will to work through these kinds of thorny regulatory issues and transitions in models of how we do things. That's a, that's a tough leadership problem. And again, I'll come back to the theme that's emerged here. It's going to have to be an international response. But that push and pull is, is, is permanent. Just a quick response. I think the sharp elbows, that's how market, markets work. I get asked all the time because there's dozens of, uh, you know, we have a small launch uh, vehicle that we're developing. And so we're talking to all these young companies that are that are building the CubeSats and, and, and slightly larger satellites up to, you know, dorm room refrigerator style. So we talk to all these guys. And people always ask me, are they going to be successful? And I always answer, that question doesn't make any sense. It's like asking, are all the restaurants that open in New York City going to be successful? Of course not. That's how our economy is built. People pe get passionate. They, they pour their heart into something. Hopefully some of them succeed, some of them fail. And then from the people who fail, they pick themselves up, and all that knowledge that they generated inspire another generation. I mean, when I started in this business in the 80s, um, by the way, John Logsdon, wherever he is, actually got me to Washington and got me my first job. So. And Scott Pace, who's the head of the Space Council, I gave him his first job. Yeah. <laughs> the circle is Cash unbroken. Cash in on that. <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, I think this is how markets are supposed to work. We want to see this energy, and we, we know that there's going to be a creative destruction, and, and th that's that's natural, and we should embrace that. And and failure in this market is it's it's not it's not the end; it's the beginning of something else. Can I just add on one you thing, Richard? Rich, I know we're, we're tight for time. Uh, rising above the politics, I think you got to look at the inspiration of this industry. Look around this room; that's just filled with. The majority of these people were born after the Apollo landings. We're always going to have politics. We're, we're here in the, the home where, where lobbyists were created, you know, 20 feet down the, the hall. Um, but I think the inspiration that is coming from our industry, from, from all sectors, from, from the launch, from the satellites, from the work that's being done on the, the International Space Station, I think that is what's drawing the, this new generation to the space community. So we'll, we'll have the politics and we'll have the discussion and a lot of times it's in a very cordial manner and we'll have it over a glass of wine later. But uh, I, I think it, what's driving everyone in this room is the inspiration that space provides. Last question for the secretary. A little bit of a politics question. Will the administration successfully kill the space core 
As many of us know, the House of Representatives has passed a law, the Defense Authorization <laughs> Bill. Time. Yes. Time. The answer is that'll, that'll sort itself out. <laughs> On that note, Jacqueline, okay, you want to well, close this out? I, I definitely wish we had more time for this conversation, but unfortunately we're out of time. I think my key takeaway is that it is a, a really busy time. There's a ton going on, and I am super excited to, to keep watching and see what will happen. Um, thank you again to all our panelists for taking the time to, to chat with us this evening. We want to <laughs> hand. And we'd like to extend another thank you to Digital Globe for making this event possible. And finally, a big thank you to everyone in the audience for coming out and joining us tonight and all those watching on the live stream. We hope you found it as interesting as we did. Um, please stay tuned and follow Political Live on social media for information about more upcoming great events. And now, please stick around and join us for a drink.